It's an unlikely team. Who wants to go with me? Against an unstoppable army. We're coming! Winner take all. Yeah. Jean-Claude Van Damme, Raul Julia, Street Fighter, rated PG-13. Starts Friday. Recently, I was digitizing some old off-air recordings of an MTV show called Headbangers Ball a late-night, metal-centric music video show that aired in the U.S. from 1987 until 1997. These tapes in particular were recorded in 1994. Since most of these were a solid two-hour block recording, they included all the commercials, many of which were for video games. I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to put high-quality versions of these old commercials online. Well, about as high-quality as an off-air VHS recording could be. So, let's check out some of the video game commercials of 1994. Nineteen ninety four. The Clinton years were well underway in the US, while my Buffalo Bills lost yet another Super Bowl, and Green Day's set at Woodstock 94 made them my favorite band for the next couple of years. Of course, outside of this, I was oblivious to most of the other goings on in the world. I was 15 years old, and fully embroiled in the world of 16-bit gaming, and 1994 brought some of the all-time greats. Donkey Kong Country, Sonic 3, freaking Super Metroid. It was during this year that Nintendo thought it was time to shed their perceived kitty persona and began to ramp up into their Play It Loud period. This edgy and in-your-face makeover was an attempt to appear as cool as Sega, but ended up being a misguided effort and, let's be honest, super annoying, even for the target audience like myself. Remember, you're a tiger kid! A tiger! That's using your head strategy! Don't worry, kid, it'll heal! No super punch-out, only for Super NES. Get smart, or get knocked stupid. You're the king, I tell you! The king! That's not to say these commercials were all annoying. Super Punch-Out was a long-awaited follow-up to the NES hit and didn't need to be crazy to get people interested. To anyone, the game looked gorgeous. The huge character sprites made it look insanely graphically impressive, especially in the short bursts we see in this 15-second spot. While Super Punch-Out may not be one of the console's most essential games, it was an excellent follow-up to the original and was the last entry in the series until 2009. Uniracers, on the other hand, a game where you took control of a sentient unicycle to pull off some crazy tricks, had to lean into that coolness factor a little bit harder. This week on the Thrasher's Roundtable, our panel of daredevils discusses Uniracers only for Super NES. It's like Shingo Will Borden, down the track, double roll, flying! How did you find the two-player action? Man, I was hauling, scanning on the brawl, hit the ice smack, flip city. Ace the dude's time, glue action, triple flip, bacon in the pan. Well, it appears then to be totally slamming. Next week, doing triple flips without tossing your comfits. Good night. Let's not fool ourselves. Despite being unique and interesting, Uniracers wasn't exactly a looker, and honestly, it's kind of surprising that it got as elaborate of a commercial as it did. In the end, it got lost in the mushroom cloud of the megaton bomb that was Donkey Kong Country, which released just before it. The unicycles themselves have a sort of CG look to them, not that you'd be able to tell with the quick cuts in this 30 second spot. But the look did prompt the pre-Toy Story Pixar to go after developer DMA Design and Nintendo because of a similarity to an animated short of theirs called Red's Dream. This prevented the game from getting another print run, and the game faded into a relative obscurity. Just as Nintendo was starting to get in your face with their advertising, Sega thought it was time to get a little bit weird. The Genesis and Sega CD was driven to success on the shoulders of amazing advertising. The Sega Scream, and my personal favorite, Welcome to the Next Level. For those who purchased something other than a Sega Genesis. Yeah, that's it. Our sincere condolences. What a waste. When you start with a Genesis, you can always add a Sega CD. And new Genesis 32X. Everything else is cold and stiff. Burial or cremation? Welcome to the next level. Sega never had a problem talking smack against other console makers, although they were oddly unspecific here. The games they advertised were a curious choice. Jurassic Park Rampage Edition was a revamp of the popular game based on the movie, 
which was just then seeing a home video release. And Echo, The Tides of Time, a well-regarded sequel that added some cool 3D on-rail segments. On the Sega CD front, you get the requisite FMV games and Batman Returns, whose 3D driving segments were still among the most impressive graphics on the system. And the last segment brought us the ill-fated 32X, which was scheduled for release that November. This add-on also got a dedicated commercial for its launch. Since the beginning of time, mankind has striven to double and redouble his powers. A mysterious machine has appeared in homes across America. All right, baby. Increase the power of the unit 40 times. 32. X. Welcome to the next life. You spill your drink? I don't have a drink. Uh-oh. Am I crazy, or could this be the start of Sega getting weird and obnoxious with their advertising? Some games are quickly represented, with the most emphasis on Doom. The popular PC game was starting to appear on every console, and this version may have been one of the best, if not THE best, port at the time. Of course, the 32X wasn't the only thing that Sega had on their plate for the holiday season that year. The second half of Sonic 3 was on the way that October. From the North Pole, two renegade elves leave on a mission to deliver an amazing new game that will change every Sonic game ever created for Genesis. Not now. We're never gonna make we'll it. We'll make it, we'll make it. Sonic and Knuckles arriving October 18th. Maybe. I guess since I wasn't too huge of a fan of Sonic 2, the release of 3 and subsequently Sonic and Knuckles passed me by. I never realized that the lock on cart was released the same year as Sonic 3. This holiday-centric spot wasn't the main advertising campaign for the game, and it doesn't even mention the then-revolutionary feature of the lock-on technology. As we all know, Sonic 3 locked on the Sonic and Knuckles went on to be what many considered the definitive Sonic experience, and for the most part, it's still regarded as such today. But did you know that Sega also released this in 1994? Since library communication is pathetic, here's the IR-7000 from Sega. Send messages back and forth to your hoodlum friends without getting busted. So get the message, get the IR-7000. Man, I never knew that the IR-7000 existed until I saw the commercial for it on these tapes. This portable communicator device was created by Casio and released by Sega. Send messages, fight battles, cheat on tests. I'm surprised that this thing wasn't more popular. In a time before cell phones, it seems like it would have been a great device for kids in school. Huge thanks to Sean Long at RGT85 for hooking me up with a unit to take a look at. But unfortunately, I couldn't get the screen to work. He has a deeper look at the device and its history on his YouTube channel. Check it out. So Sega and Nintendo, battling it out for superiority over the console market. But they weren't alone. Sega Genesis is 16 bits, 3DO is 32 bits, the Atari Jaguar is 64 bits, so is 64 bits and 3D graphics that you can only get with Jaguar. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Hmm? Huh? Jaguar! Atari's 64-bit Jaguar console had been on the market for just about a year in 1994. Atari made the pitch with the Do the Math campaign, which made it seem like an enormous jump in power over even the 32X, which was just on deck. This, of course, was a bit of fudging of the numbers by Atari. It's kind of amazing just how little actual gameplay footage they show, the centerpieces being the system's two heavy-hitting first-person shooters, Wolfenstein 3D and Aliens vs. Predator. The JAG wasn't the only system celebrating its one-year anniversary in 1994, though. If you're not playing on a 3DO system, What are you playing with? Presenting 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. It's time to put away your toys. 3DO from Panasonic, Gold Star, and Creative Labs. A new low price and free games. Taking a page from Sega's book of advertising, the 3DO was advertised aggressively as a machine for grown-ups. I guess you had to be an adult to afford its insane $699 price tag, right? Go working late tonight! The passive type probably plays Nintendo. Go working late tonight! I can't! I got therapy! The aggressive type probably plays Sega. Go working late tonight! Could we try that with a knock? And the other type definitely plays 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. 
3DO from Panasonic Gold Star and Creative Labs. Now $3.99 plus free games. What an obnoxious commercial, right? By mid to late 1994, when these spots aired, the price had already been slashed by $300. Honestly though, both of these commercials showed some really good games. Need for Speed, Road Rash, and Madden from EA were all excellent games, and they did a lot to really show off the power of the system. Super Street Fighter II Turbo was the cherry on top. And finally, believe it or not, the CDI was also being heavily advertised in 1994, with Phil Hartman of all people in tow. Say you're dancing to your favorite CD and someone says... I can see it, man! I can see it! And you're thinking... Loser! But actually, it's a premonition. It's CDI, friends! Next generation CD player that works with your TV! I see amazing movies, man. I see incredible games. I see this whole world. That guy creeps me out. I think he's kind of interesting. Now get into CDI, starting at $2.99 with three titles free, including Burn Psycho! Phil Hartman playing a bunch of characters isn't exactly how I'd expect the CDI to be advertised, but it works here. Lots of games are shown, and since FMV was the system's forte, almost all games highlighted here are of that variety. The CDI was originally released by Philips in 1991, so it had been around for a while at this point. This spot is an advertisement for the Magnavox iteration, which was priced at a more modest $299, down from the original $700 price tag. This bundle got you some free games, including Burn Cycle, which was arguably the console's killer app, and also got its own commercial. You know what I hate, man? When you go to see the big gold Buddha, and you pick the leave with the virus on it. Soon the world will be divided into two groups. Infected your brain. What? And those who've experienced Burn Cycle, the ultimate cinematic adventure game. Must be one hell of a virus. And those who think the first group is just strange. Burn Cycle, it's not just a game, it's an infection. Only on CDI. Now get Burn Cycle free when you get into CDI. Burn Cycle was a big, expensive game that was heavily advertised in his day. I remember this commercial airing on TV a lot, but I've still never played it. Burn Cycle was very similar to The Seventh Guest, which released on computers in 1993. Puzzle segments with some FMB-based story elements, and first-person target segments made for something that seemed like an evolution of the genre. Its Wii Remote style controller seemed perfect for the game. So we've checked in with all the major console developments of 1994, but what were third parties offering at the time? Let's take a look. <laughs> if you were a teenager in the early 1990s and you watched MTV, then it's safe to say that you knew Beavis and Butthead. The show about two idiot metalheads became a cultural sensation of sorts and remains one of the most quintessential pieces of 90s entertainment. Alas, as with all popular properties, it was only a matter of time before we saw a video game based on it. Change it. Feel the thrill of the chase. Discover new and powerful weapons. And control the destinies of America's leading morons. Whoa. Two morons, three different games. The Beavis and Butthead video game for Genesis, Game Gear, and Super NES. What's interesting is that all three versions of the Beavis and Butthead video game were completely different, with the Genesis version being the focus in this spot. That version was more of a point-and-click style adventure with some action segments, while the Game Gear and Super NES versions are much more Twitch-based action games. Ultimately, none of these three games were all that great, releasing the poor reviews despite being featured on the cover of some of the most popular magazines at the time. The Beavis and Butthead games were released and quickly forgotten. The X-Men were hugely popular in the 90s. Although I don't follow comics much these days, I've heard my fair share of people look fondly upon the era. Once Capcom took the reins of the characters from Sega and Konami, the first game we got was X-Men Mutant Apocalypse on the Super NES, a side-scrolling beat-em-up that featured the most iconic characters from the time period. How about those costumes? It really helps you appreciate just how well done the costumes in comic book movies are these days, doesn't it? This commercial goes so far to make it seem like Wolverine and Cyclops are the only playable characters, 
which is weird because the game also includes Gambit, who might just be the most popular X-Men of the 90s. Mutant Apocalypse released at a time when Capcom ruled the world with Street Fighter 2 being the must-have game everywhere. I'm not sure how well this X-Men game did, but its follow-up, the arcade one-on-one -on -one fighter X-Men Children of the Atom, was the beginning of a relationship that continues even today. There's nothing like some good old 90s gross-out humor, right? Well, gird your loins for this next spot. If you had jalapenos and beans for every meal, you'd have an atomic butt blast too. Boogerman for Sega Genesis. Hey, boogers aren't his only weapon. Wasn't me! Boogerman, a pick and flick adventure from Interplay, was a pretty good encapsulation of 90s gross out humor. Inspired by shows such as Ren and Stimpy, the heavy use of Foley effects in this spot really makes my stomach churn. Every gurgle, chew, and squish is turned up to 11 to a point where I just want it to be over with. In the years immediately preceding the prequels, the Star Wars series maintained its popularity by appearing across a number of different mediums. The Super Star Wars games were sort of a reintroduction of the series to me. Sure, I love them. I mean, heck, I saw Return of the Jedi opening night when I was five, but it was this trilogy of Super NES games that brought them back into my life in a big way. Feel the Force with Super Return of the Jedi. The final and greatest chapter in the Star Wars trilogy for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Perhaps it was the yearly release schedule, but by the time Jedi rolled around in 94, my enthusiasm had begun to seriously wane, and I doubt I was the only one. This seems to be the only game from the series that got a commercial as far as I can tell, and was probably just put out there to drum up a little bit more excitement. Of course, Star Wars wasn't the only hot film property that LucasArts had, and another game was being developed to be released alongside Jedi. Indiana Jones Greatest Adventures for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. All three Indiana Jones adventures in one action-packed game. While the Super Star Wars series was developed by Sculptured Software, LucasArts brought in Factor 5 to develop Indiana Jones Greatest Adventures, also exclusively on the Super Nintendo. This time, instead of splitting each movie into their own, Indy gets one game to cover Raiders, Doom, and Crusade. These days, I don't think that the Super Star Wars or Indiana Jones SNES games are considered to be very good, but I absolutely have a bit of a soft spot for them, especially the first Super Star Wars. Pitfall was the first game I ever remember playing. In 1994, the series was revived after eight years with Pitfall, the Mayan Adventure. Introducing Pitfall, the jungle adventure video game from Activision. Just a reminder, not everyone wins. Pitfall, the Mayan adventure for Sega Genesis and Super NES from Activision. Yeah, another game that isn't considered to be too good these days. I found it interesting that the live action segments in the commercial were used as the FMV opening to the Sega CD version that was released later on. Pitfall Harry's son takes up the mantle to continue the treasure hunting adventure. The animation on the main character is pretty good, but there's a tiny bit of input lag built into the game that drives me nuts. Another iconic game from the Atari era also got a new release in 1994, Space Invaders on the Game Boy. What it is is Space Invaders for Game Boy and Super Game Boy. What it does is unleash a steady stream of alien forces who keep coming and coming, just like in the arcade, till it feels like a vice in your central nervous system while it's going down like two-legged hell <laughs> Oh, that hurt. Yeah. You know Space Invaders because it's one of the most iconic games of all time. This commercial knows it, and it doesn't even need to show you any actual gameplay for you to be interested. If you're a fan, you know you're going to buy it already. But this game does harbor a little secret that isn't even mentioned at all, and is a huge reason to even buy it in the first place. Inserting the cartridge into a Super Game Boy and booting arcade mode gives you a full-on SNES experience on a Game Boy cart. I don't really even watch basketball at all these days, but in 1994, with players like Michael Jordan and of course Shaquille O'Neal, it was a great time to be a fan. I gotta say, this next commercial was a very pleasant surprise to find on these tapes. It's not a great game, but I was inexplicably excited to find it. 
Shaquille O'Neal, a.k.a. Jack Shaquino Bounty Hunter. Enforcer of justice. Left hand. Right hand. Registered. <laughs> lethal weapons. Like foot. Left foot. Size 22. Registered lethal weapons. <laughs> this is your target. Introducing Shaq Fu. Kung Fu Shaq style. <laughs> For Sega Genesis and Super NES. Man, I honestly can't understand 90% of what's coming out of this guy's mouth. Size 22! This one-on-one -on -one fighting game starring Shaq was developed by Delphine Software, most famous for Another World and Flashback. It's a ridiculous idea that has become a bit of a meme these days. <laughs> but the Super NES and the Superior Genesis version are showed pretty equally throughout the commercial, although the very end makes it seem like it was an SNES exclusive. Accolade, a publisher most well known for releasing the Bubsy games, were also responsible for a number of other acclaimed titles such as... Um... What's this magazine doing under your bed? Get that weed whack away from my door! That's string bean or big bean? You expect to pass this class. Introducing the first Doom-like game for Sega. Zero tolerance. Because there's just way too much reality out there. An oil change and a free burger with cheese. Don't forget the ketchup. In a lot of ways, this is the most 90s commercial out of the whole bunch, if only because of the font used. That said, only in a time before Columbine would a commercial like this fly. Most fascinating is how misrepresented the game is in this spot, which removes the entire HUD and only shows the FPS gameplay, letterboxed over a black screen. I get why they did this though, having the HUD taking up around 80% of the screen makes for a pretty jumbled mess. As I said many times before, Doom was a behemoth in 1994. Everyone wanted to make a game like it, hoping to emulate its success. Zero Talents on the Genesis was the first to try, and the first to fail. Although it's fairly interesting. When Mortal Kombat 2 came to home consoles, it was one of the biggest games of 1994. To go along with such a big release, Acclaim put together a commercial that still holds up incredibly well today. It's important to realize that this spot predated the release of the Mortal Kombat movie, which was still a year off. Besides Baraka, the costume designs are absolutely awesome and authentic to the game. It almost makes you wonder if they used the real ones that were digitized with the actors for the game. Round one, fight. This commercial really makes the release feel like the event that it was, and it helped that the games themselves were excellent ports, especially the SNES version, which was my console version of choice. For the first time, Nintendo finally let go and allowed such blatant, extreme blood and violence on their console. And to have a commercial like this to commemorate the event was only appropriate. Jack wins. Fatality. Looking back on it now, I wonder how many games I bought because they looked awesome in the commercial. I'd sit and watch hours of TV hoping to catch a glimpse of a game I was excited for. There was just something about the elusive nature of gameplay videos in the 90s that made the possibilities of what each game was like run rampant in my mind. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you saw a video game commercial on television? Today you can just go check out full HD clips of any game you're excited for. We're lucky, and maybe a bit spoiled. But in 1994, we couldn't guess if the end product would go down in history as a classic, forgotten, or infamous. But no matter what we think of them today, these commercials capture a moment in time when any game could be something special.
Clear magnetic heading 185. Ground speed 880 feet per second. Check. While toy companies cut their teeth on dolls that wet themselves, we were busy defending the entire free world. Fog detonation systems. Long ordinance is hot. Target is in the cradle, sir. But now the real fun begins. Mommy? Introducing the Interactor first interactive game fest that lets you feel the action. 